Hi, this is Mrs. Duncan for Theater Appreciation Class. I have to tell you, this is my favorite chapter because of all the roles that I've had with theater. The one I've had the most is that of director. So pardon me if I get a little excited sometimes. First of all, where did it come from? We didn't always have directors. Um, it comes from a Greek word, like everything else, right? For teacher, okay? So it was the teacher, the instructor. And it's kind of like um, a theater coach, but it's for the play. Up until the 19th century, which is the 1800s, the playwright, the person who wrote the play, or the leading actor also had a double as the director. Now we see that today with films, but it's a whole lot easier because you can tell them what you want them to film with the camera. Stop, look at it, and then decide if you want to do it differently. It's a little bit harder. I have avoided being the actor on stage and being the director. I've done it a few times in a small skit. Um, what you can't see, what you need to see is the director if you're up on the stage. If you're the playwright, oh my goodness, you definitely have ideas about how it should go. And I have written small uh, plays and directed them, but it, uh, more recently it's typically been a separate roles. So when we look back and go, well, who really kind of did what defines the role of a director? Uh, it, we go back to this particular person in history, George II. Not King George, but he's a duke, so he's a little bit of royalty, but he's in, Germ in the German uh, territory. Uh, and his, you know, um, his duchy, his area, the Saxon minor gen. Uh, and what his, uh, anyway, you don't need to know that part, but 1826 to 1914, he was the supreme ruler of his particular territory. Um, he was the top dog and he is credited as the first modern director. So he really obviously liked theater and uh, because he was wealthy, he was able to make his own theater company and build his own theater and organize uh, and hire um, people that, he, you know, he could call in and, and say, you're talented, I want you to work for me, I have the money to pay you. So he could get a resident company of actors to be the characters and artists, because you got to have designers and uh, scenic and makeup and so forth, right? Because we're not at this point using masks anymore, okay? Um, but anyway, so he could afford to hire them and keep them on salary. He was the first that we know of to have long rehearsals and really be focused on realistic acting. Uh, without going into too much of it, acting had kind of become, and this is after Shakespeare, sort of these, uh, you kind of had these roles that you would play as a professional actor. You knew your role and you gave your speeches and you did your thing. And there wasn't a lot of I mean, you were that person, uh, that character. You were Macbeth because you played Macbeth a particular way, and there wasn't a lot of need for a director once you knew your part and kind of where you were supposed to stand on the stage because they would do them over and over and over, and you might be Macbeth for, for years um, until you aged out, but um, <clears throat> which didn't typically happen with those kinds of roles. Uh, or you always played Hamlet, or you always played um, Claudia. Well, the girl parts, I should say. Um, it's continued to be played by women, by the way, but they were young, I mean by men, but it was young boys, so you could age out of that. <clears throat> but he was able to hire them in, and he spent a lot of time rehearsing, and he wanted it to be just perfect. Um, he did such a great job without anybody else kind of telling him what to do that we know of, that the most famous uh, acting coach or method theorist, Stanislavski, he borrowed, he borrowed a lot of the Duke's techniques uh, for his art theater in Russia with Moscow. So when we get to the, uh, you remember the acting chapter, Stanislavski, right? Stanislavski method, it's still used today. It's just like classic. Um, he has some of his ideas from this guy. So the first modern director, George II, the Duke, here. That's probably all you have to remember. Know that for the quiz, you'll, you know, uh, you'll be able to recognize the name. You don't have to spell it. All right, so what does a director do? I think you kind of have generally an idea, um, but for a play, 
there's a lot of work that goes in before the rehearsals start. And rehearsals are a lot of work, but there's a lot of work ahead of time. And it's months in advance. Um, <clears throat> script analysis is what you do, of course, before that you even decide which script you're going to uh, perform. And that's a whole other part of the process. You have to think about, well, um, who do I have to cast uh, when you're an amateur you know, uh, theater, whether it's church or school, college, you have to look and go, okay, um, you know, if I'm, I'm doing college, I don't have a lot of old people, but if I'm doing community theater, a lot of those folks are retired. I need something that works for the group of actors that are, are going to be, uh, I'm going to be casting from. Um, you can open up auditions, but you got to have a realistic idea of what you can get, right? So once you get and decide on your script, then uh, you've got to analyze it. Okay, we talked about acting analysis in the acting chapter. You got to, as a director, you have to analyze the script before it even gets to the actor. If the playwright is available, the person that wrote the play, that's great. You can reach out to them, and and I have uh, done that. Um, you know, obviously with Shakespeare or Henrik Ibsen, you can't, or Oedipus the King. You read what you can about them and that play. You can do some research on it. But the one I worked on uh, with Auburn University Montgomery a few years back, I was not the director, I was the dramaturg, which does the research for the director. And so we had reached out and I reached out to the um, playwright for that play that they were doing called Coupler. But I did most of my own research, so as I did that. All right, well, you spent a lot of time can't even count the hours that you read the script and read it again and read it again and read it again because then you see different things and you see more than you saw the first or second or third time. You have to understand how it works and functions and everything. As a director, you have to have you have to know the whole play, forwards and backwards. Um, as an actor, you only really have to know your part and how your character interacts with others. Sometimes you have to do historical research, um, as you can see already from the plays that we have read and watched together, they could be set in very different time periods and you have to do some research to know kind of what was going on at the time. For Coupler, that one had two things going on. One, it was set, its modern setting was a the subway station um, in London, okay, and there was that, because I, and then there was a sort of subtext kind of going on with the story Peter Pan and different characters were influenced or kind of related to the Peter Pan um, characters. So I had to go back and reread that and see, you know, more about Wendy and who was Tinkerbell and who, who was that character, you know, this particular character, who would they be in the Peter Pan story? Oh, that's Captain Hook. Oh, that's uh, man, kind of the, the dog, you know, but it's not a dog, it's a person. Um, so you have to do some research. I also had to do research on trains and subways because Coupler is a part of that hooks one car to the train car to the other and that was a metaphor in the play. Well, the other parts that this is, we're not done yet. The director has so much work to do before. Uh, they have to do a lot of analysis. They have to figure out what they believe are the main themes and ideas because that's what you're trying to get across when uh, theater is art. And then uh, really study the characters and how they're the same, how they're different, what their motivations are. They have to have a good idea of all the characters, not just the, you know, if you're an actor, you just really have to worry about yourself. Um, then you break down the play into small scenes, like uh, French scenes are, are every time there's an exit or an entrance by somebody, so you have to break it down into smaller pieces. And then even within that, when there is a shift in the topic of conversation. You know how that happens in real life. You're talking on one and then all of a sudden say, hey, what about this? And you're, the, the conversation goes a completely different direction. Um, that's called a beat and that happens in plays and you have to mark those so you know, you know you're aware that that's happening um, as the director. Then there's this, after you've really picked it apart and looked at it so in depth and minute pieces, then you got to back up and go, okay, how am I going to, what's going to characterize my production? Like, how are we going to do this? And how am I going to bring, bring my creative, uh, you know, imagination to it? So what is that visual uh, 
image that's going to kind of characterize this production? Are we going to be very realistic? Are we going to be sort of uh, stylistic? Are we going to uh, be kind of abstract? So what's that primary metaphor or symbol or concept that's going to sort of hold all this together and that we're really going to use to get across the theme of this? How, how are we going to do that visually and um, whether it's costumes or lighting or the set, right? That's why all these different productions can look very different, although they'll say the same words because the play, right, script can't be altered. Um, and, you know, and you have the same descriptions of characters. They can be very nuanced and uh, so forth. So the directors, the director comes up with that overall idea and then they get the designers together and say, hey, this is what I'm going for. This is the look. This is the feel. Um, and I need you to kind of, you know, give me back a design that comes back with that. Uh, the coupler one was play is a great example because of that Peter Pan story background um, to the play. Obviously, the the setting for the play itself had to kind of look like a subway uh, in London. Um, but because of the nuances of the Peter Pan characters, the costume designer uh, used those that research I did and said, well, so-and-so is most like the uh, Peter Pan character. This character is the most like the Wendy character. This character is the most like Captain Hook. And uh, this is the most like the mom. This is the most like, you know, as we go through. So Tinkerbell. And she used that to inspire her costume. So the character who was most like Captain Hook, even though he was wearing modern clothes, he had sort of a villain uh, pinstripe looking suit and he had kind of long flowy dark hair and then his little handkerchief his little handkerchief and tie were had skull and crossbones on it so that concept of hey we're going to be subtle uh, but we're going to have those influences the Peter Pan characters in there and if you didn't know it you might not see it except the first time we see that Tinkerbell character she almost pretty much looks just about like Tinkerbell but after that her uh, image changes um, when the Wendy character is always wearing that like little blue dress and looking innocent. Um, so some of it was pretty consistent. What well, was that concept that we brought to it that was unique and no one else who had performed that play had done that before. Uh, so it looked completely different. Um, the playwright came down and watched it down there in Montgomery. Really loved that. Didn't had not seen anybody do that before. So that was that creative thing that we brought uh, to it by focusing that on as, as the primary concept. All right, the, the next thing that you do after you've studied the play, you decide, you know, you've really analyzed it, you've really got a real good idea of, hey, this is the way I want to do this. You have to have actors and you have to cast them. That's what you call when you pick who's going to be in it. And you have various types of auditions. We talked more about that in the audition uh, chapter, the chapter on acting and the different types of auditions and you decide based on where you're at um, and then you have to you know they all do their little thing that you ask them to do and you have to decide so there's different theories and ways you go about it with amateur uh, actors which is what I have always dealt with not professionals um, you tend to cast too tight which means you're looking for someone who already kind of fits they kind of look the part they kind of seem to have the, the vocal quality, uh, the look, uh, they just look like they fit that part, okay? And you have to sometimes keep that in mind all the way around. That's the most common thing because if it doesn't, if that person doesn't appear without makeup to be similar enough to the character already physically, it's going to be really hard to pull that character off. Um, I remember seeing Red Mountain Theater's Beauty and the Beast. They did that you know is live and you can put a wig on the girl sure you know give her the hair color you want if she's Ariel from Little Mermaid or Belle uh, but the guy that's playing Gaston he better be pretty big guy you, you're not gonna pull off the character of Gaston if he uh, is he is physically built more like his little sidekick uh, the, 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 the boof something like that right he needs to be tall he needs to be pretty big guy so uh, 
you know, those kinds of things. Uh, our Peter Pan character guy was kind of small to medium build. Captain Hook, a uh, fellow who played that role, he had a different name. Um, he was taller, you know, a little bit bigger. It just has to kind of go. And and then the girl that played Wendy and the girl that played Tinkerbell couldn't be, you know, the, the size uh, there has to be some compatibility. But occasionally you do number two casting against type. And a lot of professional actors really go for that because they don't want to be typecast. You've heard that before, typecast, where they only get the same roles over and over and over and over. And over. They're never going to win an Academy Award or an Emmy or anything like that if they're just playing the same role all the time. The uh, actor that we studied a little bit in uh, the last chapter on acting, Denzel Washington, he plays a lot against type because he plays a great good guy, but boy, wow, he can play the villain. Um, and that's good. You know, that's good acting. We really can see that. We will see him again later in when we uh, do this, the play Fences, which is later in our semester. He plays the uh, father. Not really a villain, but not really a good guy. Kind of not mm, only marginally <laughs> likable. Definitely times when we don't like him. Um, so that's a casting against type. Another one is gender neutral. There are some roles that it doesn't matter uh, whether they're male or female. They could be, you know, there's all kinds of, usually not major or main characters. Um, you know, so you can, it doesn't matter, so you cast them either way, whoever fits best, or you want to make sure everybody gets a role, so you cast them in that. Cross-gender casting is when you actually go against what's in the script, and uh, we did that in Coupler. Um, the assistant to the one of the main characters who would be most like the mother, in uh, Peter Pan, uh, had a, had an assistant, and in the original, the, the assistant was female. And uh, I, the director Neil um, Cycle, who's down at AUM, he wanted to use this young man, who's a very good actor, but you know he wasn't female. So what they decided to do was make him the uh, assistant, which was fine, but not but. You can't change the lines, so they cast him as a um, a gay homosexual man as the as the assistant. And the young man who did it, David, he did a fabulous job. And but we had to get permission from the playwright because we had actually changed something fundamental to the script. But she was okay with that. Um, colorblind casting is that that it's not it. You just don't even worry about racial differences. Um, you can do a mixed, diverse, you know, family. Uh, you could take Oedipus the King. You can have, you know, anybody of any race play those parts. And that's that's a really big thing, you know, today because we we uh, really promote, you know, diversity. All right. So those are the different things you take into consideration um, when you're casting. All right. I'm going to pause here because this is kind of long, and I'm going to do a part two.